hello. As penance for getting the time wrong, I've decided to come on a few minutes early and just say hello. I might switch from regular tea to whiskey because it's now very late. But <laughs> sorry about that glitch earlier. The problem is time zones all over the world. There's a lot of them and it's been a very long week. I've been working on like four different projects, a couple different TV shows, and I just, today didn't have it together, but we're in it together, hello. So for the next 15 minutes, I will just be chatting with you and I will answer questions if you ask them. And then Jay, who I know is awake now because I texted him like, Jay, I fucked up. Um, Jay will be here and we will talk about murder and such. Okay, everyone is asking if I'm sitting under the stairs. Technically? Technically. Because like I'm in a house and the best lighting situation is under the staircase. And I don't want to back it up so you can see anymore because then you'll see what a travesty this table is. But kind of, yes, I am under the stairs. But it's like a nice space under the stairs. Uh, favorite ad some character? Depends on the book. I have to say that my favorite ad some character overall is probably either Rye or Holland. Yeah, I knew Holland's arc from when I first started the series. So I knew who he was going to be and who he was going to become. And so he's always had a very, very special place in my heart because I knew who he was gonna be by the end of Conjuring of Light. I don't know, my chat things have frozen. Oh, there we go. What am I working on now? I can't tell you a lot of it. That's the crazy thing. I'm working on something and I'm hopefully gonna be able to announce it soon if it happens, but it might not happen because that's apparently the nature of my life now. But I'm also working on finishing up revisions on the Conjuring, that's, what am I doing? I'm on the third City of Ghosts book, Bridge of Souls. And I'm working on some short stories and I'm working on a lot of things I can't talk about. Favorite tea flavor? Oh my God, there's so many questions. Oh no. Yeah, I lost my favorite drinking mug for like, ah, for like two days. And then I found it in a microwave and I just left it there. Um, oh, I'm glad that you guys all like Holland. Okay, wait, I have to get to the... Yes, Rye is pronounced Rye, like why? And I'm very sorry. What's your strategy to pick yourself up? Today, I took a three hour nap in the middle of the day because some days you just can't. Um, how many Cassie Blake books will there be? At least three? I don't know. Um, more information about Threads of Power. I am writing it, kinda right now. Oh my god, guys, there are a lot of questions. Hold on, I gotta get to the bottom. Okay. Um, anyway, let me get, uh, Bridge of Souls, last book in the series? I don't know. Adsom, not a TV show. Adsom, Shades of Magic, is in development for film, and it's being written by... Uh, a guy named Derek Kolstad who wrote the John Wick franchise and it, I am so over the moon excited. Also, yes, I do have a pretty cool philosophy that I think a lot of people have a very superstitious philosophy about not talking about things until they're official and ready and such. But yes, um, who knows? Shades of Magic has a long way to go, but it is, like I say, I should be seeing the script soon and it's basically like the studio team that brought you Spider-Man and the producer's team that brought you Fast and the Furious and then the writer who brought you John Wick. So, I mean, I'm in pretty good hands. I'm excited. I think you always have to remember that like the book and the movie, if the movie happens, will be different. Okay, lots of questions about will there be special editions of Addie LaRue. We're working on it right now. I know there will be a couple signed options, one hopefully in the UK and one hopefully in the US. I don't know about the other foreign editions yet, um, but there will be some signed options. As soon as I have more information in the next month or so, I promise that I will let you know. Also, if I sound like disoriented in any way. I haven't actually been drinking at all today. I am just really tired because I thought this chat was going to be at 11 p.m. and instead it's at midnight. And even though I took a three hour nap today, that was a stress nap. Okay, um, pre-order goodies, here's the thing. I love being able to give pre-order goodies, but they're um, an absolute nightmare to arrange in terms of organization and that's without a pandemic. 
that's clogging up a lot of supply channels right now. A lot of um, technical problems are coming up. So this might be one of those books where the pre-order gift is that you give you the future you a book. And I will try to see if we can come up with something else, but um, yeah, it's tricky. Honestly, just getting the books printed and made and keeping everything on schedule is really, really hard when supply chains collapse and everyone is quarantined under the stairs, as you can see. Um, oh, and thank you for my hair. It's got, like you can tell, it has a little bit of the red line and that's because I just did like an emergency dye dying job today um, because I couldn't handle having the blonde roots anymore. And so that means for the next like two days, there'll be like a little red line right there. But you know what? Favorite Neil Gaiman book, probably Neverwhere. Either it's a tie between Neverwhere and the Graveyard book. Um, I'm seeing some more stuff about pre-order gifts. You know, like I, I like giving pre-order stuff. It's just, it's difficult. Um, because of all the situations and because it's a lot of extra work on my part. And honestly, I'm just trying to get everything out in a timely fashion. Also, yes, there will eventually be a third uh, Vicious book, but knowing me, it'll probably be like five years from now. <laughs> I'm very behind on a lot, on a lot of things. Um, yeah, I'm trying to keep up with yeah, I'm I'm going to switch to whiskey here in a second. Favorite Jay Kristoff book. Ooh, that's a hard one. Probably Nevernight. I just, that book took me so much by surprise. And I, I was over the moon about it. It was like a book that was made for me. I should save all this praise for when Jay gets here so that we can boost his ego because I'm sure it's not big enough. But also, yes, this will be saved to my Instagram page for a little while. And then it will go and it will live over on YouTube with the other videos. Uh, go about requesting ARCs. If you mean for Addy, you can request it through NetGalley or through Idlewise, but they are being really, really strict in like not trying to let, not giving it out too freely because it's a really, really fine balance between, uh, you know, wanting a lot of people to read it now and like wanting people to buy it when it comes out, which I really would like you guys to buy it so that I have a career ahead of me. Also, I've now opened this whiskey and realized that I can't drink it until I finish drinking the tea that's in my teacup, which is really, really not fair. So I'm going to put the cap back on the whiskey because also I probably need to be coherent, even though it will be very early. Um, I do like Lagavulin. This is Oban and I have Talisker next door. Thank you for pre-ordering Addy. Oh my God, I'm a huge Donna Tart fan. So the person that asked Secret History is like one of my most influential books of all time. Patricia, yes, people do need at least five hard copies of Addie so that they can they can share and I don't know, make a pillow out of them, lay their head down on an Addie every night. Also, I can't even put this whiskey in this tea because this is green tea. It's really unfortunate. I could get up and get another teacup, but I'm not wearing real pants. I'm wearing pajama pants and I don't want you to see that. Not because I have any shame. Yes, Jay was sleeping. <laughs> I texted Jay and I was like, Jay, fuck, I forgot. Apparently there was daylight savings time. And Jay was like, oh, I'm coming. And I was like, no, you told everybody. And he was like, okay, then I'm gonna go take a shower. So Jay should be here any moment. I feel really bad. I checked the time when we arranged this interview with Jay. I'm pretty sure it was before daylight savings time happened here. And so obviously I math is not my strength on a on a good day and then this all happened and now it's very late my time. Does Addy have fantasy elements? Yes. I mean, it's a book about a deal with the devil. So there are fantasy elements, but it's definitely more grounded in our world than a lot, than a lot of the books. Someone was like, how is no whiskey and green tea a rule for quarantine? No, I just don't think it would taste very good to have whiskey and green tea together. Um, Okay, hold on. Ooh, no spoilers. We don't ask spoilery questions. Um, stopped here a week ago. Okay, but here's the problem with daylight savings, guys. Like, it's different in every country. If the world all went daylight savings at the same time, then maybe I could keep track. But like, it's happening in a different, like daylight savings in the United States happens different from daylight savings in the UK, which happens different from daylight, and it's very confusing to me. 
It's very, very confusing. Time is a concept. It's a concept I apparently don't know what to do with. But when I had, I like messaged Jay and I was like, Jay, everybody wants us to talk, but you're in Melbourne. So like, would you get up at the crack of dawn? And Jay was like, for you, I will do this thing. So it's very sweet of him. I'm sure he's more nocturnal and I'm more like, I don't know. I don't actually have a time of day that I feel works well for me, maybe from like 10 a.m. To, to noon, maybe. And then like, I'm really good from like 8 to 9 p.m. I think, I think that's a good time for me. Um, people are asking about the timeline for Threads of Magic, Threads of Power. It's going to depend on when I finish writing the book. Also, I'm sure you guys are going to continue asking if Jay and I are going to write books together. Right now, the answer is no, but hopefully we're going to talk about why that is because we have very different creative styles, which is the whole point of this. I almost called this a podcast, but it's clearly not a podcast because you can see my face. Guys, if any of you follow me in regular time, you know that this is very much not an articulate version of me. I am usually far more articulate than this. Why am I so tired? I think it was just a bad week. Like it was a long week. And then I woke up today and all of this week just kind of hit me and I felt tired and empty and my well was drained. And it's one of the reasons I'm actually really, really looking forward to talking with Jay because getting to talk to authors always makes me feel better. But this week, Today, I have been off all day. I took like a two and a half hour nap in the middle of the day and I'm not a napper, but I clearly needed it. Where are the cat ears in Scotland with all of the rest of my possessions beside the eight articles of clothing that I took with me when I came to France because I thought surely I won't be staying that long. And yet, here we are. It's been like five weeks, so. I haven't seen the Nevernight adaptation yet. I know, I know, I need to watch it. Will there be more Lila and Kel? Yes, there will be more Lila and Kel in Threads of Power in the, the next three books. The next three books are set, so the Threads of Power books are set seven years after the end of Conjuring of Light. So um, anybody who survived a Conjuring of Light will be in Threads of Power and not just in a like, boop. They will be a major plot character in Threads of Power. Yeah, I am in France. My family lives in France. And so I have been here for five weeks. I have picked up any schools in quarantine. I have been practicing violin because it's something I took up at the very beginning of the year. Um, and I'm still, I'm glad to say I'm still really bad at it. I'm still really bad at it. So <laughs> the nice thing is though, like I can be bad at it. It's not my job which is kind of delightful. Hi, Luma Crate. I saw that those boxes went very, very, very quickly. Um, I mean, the real question, somebody just asked, will there be Holland? I stand only by what I said. If a character survived a Conjuring of Light, they will be in Threads of Power. And if they didn't, well, this is not the villain series. So, hi from Nashville. Now we're just waiting on Jay. Jay better not have fallen back asleep because I can't do this at 1 a.m. Also, not to a person who said nothing is hotter than someone who plays violin. Trust me, if you saw me playing violin, you would retract that statement because it pretty much just sounds like cats screaming. You know, but I did play a song and then it sounded a little bit less like cats screaming and I thought, that's progress right there. That is progress. Hello, everybody. I'm hoping that Jay knows how to do this. Hold on. Are you working on something you didn't tell us? If I didn't tell you what it was, it's because it's a secret. It's because I'm not allowed to say. Let's see. Jay, Jay, Jay. Jay is not here yet. What's the last TV show I watched? I'm really enjoying Prodigal Son right now. And obviously I just finished Schitt's Creek. And that was just like the most beautiful, exactly what I needed in my life right now. Also, holy shit, there are like 600 of you right now. And I don't know if I should be flattered or if Jay should be flattered or if I should be jealous that Jay is so popular, but really our Venn diagram of our readership is really just a circle. So I love it. I love that. Oh, and here he is. Hold on. 
see if this works. I really hope this works. Is it gonna work? I have no idea. Yay. Hey, mate. Oh my God. <laughs> How are you going? What the fuck is Daylight this saving. savings time? I know, we're the worst. We are the worst. It was so Math. bad, there were like 600 people here and I was like, I wonder where Jay is because I said eight o'clock and then some people from Melbourne were like, it's seven o'clock here in Melbourne. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, math mathematics has never been my strong suit. So yeah, between <laughs> the two of us, we're quite a pair. I am also How you doing anyway? non alcoholic beverage for you right now, but I after what's happened, I'm probably just gonna start putting No, you should you should get into it, yeah. It I is it is it. it's so yeah, it is eight o'clock in the morning summer. here, so I'm not gonna be on the whiskey with you, but uh feel okay. free by all means. Oh, so there's a lot of people here with us. It's Oh that's good. Hello everybody, how you doing? There are seven hundred and fifty people here right now. All right. Well, yeah, I right? uh, I will try my best to be entertaining. <laughs> it is eight o'clock in the morning though, and it's fine. You know, I didn't even know they made eight o'clock in the morning anymore. So I, I mean, thought it got banned in like twenty fourteen. So we'll see how we go. Are you a nocturnal person? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you think I've, you can I've... be a metalhead and not a nocturnal person? <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I I, I kind of naturally stray towards going to bed about two and getting up about ten. Um, okay. That's just the way my biological clock works. If I'm left to my own devices, that's kind of the pattern I fall into. So yeah. Do you have some caffeine? I do. I do. Okay. I uh, when the when the whole COVID stuff started happening, uh, I briefly panicked because I thought the coffee shop in the corner was going to get shut down. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's so. I went out and bought this coffee making machine that you need like a degree from NASA in order to be able to operate. So this is like the third time I've ever actually made a coffee in it because the coffee shop on the corner didn't shut down because it's Melbourne. So coffee yeah. is still considered an essential service. Here. <laughs> it's essential. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if so it's now good you coffee have, or not, but I have one. I have you have one. a very fancy coffee maker. Wait, so you're still allowed to get coffee from like a shop? Yeah. You have to stand kind of two meters away from everyone. They're not allowed to serve like meals there anymore, but you can still go in and get a coffee because I miss, it's Melbourne. I think we would lose our collective minds if we couldn't get coffee down here. I don't know. Well, wait, I, miss that cafes. I miss cafes more than anything else in the entire world. I've not seen like, I've not gone to a business in five weeks. So everything is shut there? Like everything? Yeah. Well, so yeah, wow. here in France, yeah, you're not allowed to travel more than like two kilometers from your home without like a dispensation explaining where you're going. And yeah, okay. you like, you if you only one person's supposed to like go grow. it's like now it's like hey update your policies um i'm back um i don't know it's just all like we're in the countryside as well so essential services are like the bar to back is open but you're not allowed to sit in it and have a cup of coffee but like you could get cigarettes right but it's are just... they still serving coffee can you get like a takeaway i'm not sure the french do takeaway like okay. the French have like a very strong philosophy against takeaway. I've never seen a takeaway cup. Okay. Also, people are commenting on your mug. So is this an Illumicrate mug that you have? Yeah, this is Illumicrate. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the name of the oh, artist. But oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, there's a that Shades was part of the Illumicrate box too. for Dark Dawn. And it is, yeah, it's beautiful. It's so I have all these... I have all these coffee mugs from book boxes and whatnot that I actually get to use now and then. So that that's yeah. one advantage of the coffee <laughs> shop not being operational. Now actually use cups. I'm trying to just finish my tea as fast as possible so that I can put whiskey in this glass. So. I mean, you could just mix the whiskey it's, and the tea. Is that a thing? Green, you, it is if it's black tea, but this is green tea. Also, oh, yeah, okay. I think I'm just looking at the questions as they scroll past and the number of people who just want to know if we're going to write a book together seems to be the reason that they've shown <laughs> up here. So I hate to disappoint everybody. But what I want to talk about is basically why we can't write a book together, right? We're going to be talking about creative process. Right. We're going to be talking, I mean, because it feels like eight in the morning is the perfect time to ask you about the nuts and bolts of your, of your mind. But, yep. um, but yeah, as I try to chug this tea so that I can fill this with whiskey, why don't we start off with, I need to hear your origin story. I need to hear how we got, like, how did you get from the beginning, uh, like, you know, to being this internationally successful author? Yeah, um, I started, uh, it, it probably started for me pretty late. Um, I studied 
graphic design in university. I've always mm -hmm. kind of been a visually minded person. Yeah. Um, there was, a, there was that weird, I don't know if you'd call it a meme, there was a test that went around on Twitter about three or four weeks ago that had four apples. Did you see that? No. There's like, there's four, a picture of four apples in a row and the one on the far left was kind of this dumpy, low res, grainy red blob and the one on the far right was like a photorealistic apple. Okay. And the Twitter thing asked you to picture an apple in your head and which on oh, yeah. the scale do you see? Um, and I, I was amazed that for the, that was the first time I realized that not everyone saw the thing on the rice, like that yeah. they don't see photo realistically. Um, so that, so that's why I see in my head. Um, so I've, I've kind of been visually minded my whole life. I studied graphic design at university. I was in a band for about five years and didn't do anything except play in a band. But then I wound up in a career as a creative, you're called a creative, uh, yeah. in advertising agencies. So basically for like 10 years, I wrote television commercials, um, which are essentially stories, but they're stories yeah. in kind of 30 second segments. So weirdly, that was kind of my training ground to becoming a writer, writer, because I, I guess if you can tell a story in 30 seconds with 50 words, then mm -hmm. you can probably write a chapter. And if you can write a chapter, then you can maybe write a book. But at the end of the day, you're basically convincing people to buy shit they don't need with money they don't have that's your job I mean, um, and you're also, yeah like it, it's it was a great job for a lot of years i'm not knocking it i've still got a lot of friends who do it but ultimately you're spending your energy on other people's things yeah. um and you don't have a lot of control either there's a whole bunch of hurdles along the way clients and market research you can you can write the greatest idea you've ever written in your life and just watch you get killed in meetings over and over again so i wanted something that was ultimately mine that i had control over so i just started working on a chapter in my spare time and i didn't tell anyone that i was doing it i didn't even tell my wife i was doing it um because i thought it was kind of silly and i thought i wouldn't be able to finish so i just plotted away on that in my free time over the course of 18 months that chapter became a book it was a pretty bad book as most first books tend to be. I'm but relieved to I, hear it. I'm relieved to hear yeah, that no, people are like, and that became my novel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Name of the Wind. It just knocked it out of the park first time. Sold a million copies, yeah. Um, yeah, it was a bad book, but I, it, I, it got me in love with the ritual of writing. Um, it gave me something that was entirely mine. It gave me a, a place to kind of escape to, I guess, for an hour every day. And so when I decided to write another book, I was a little more strategic in the way that I did it. And that was the book that ended up getting me the agent and everything kind of spiraled outwards from there. So it, it was a kind of a roundabout, roundabout way into storytelling. Although when you're writing ads, you are basically a storyteller. It's kind of like, have you ever seen Mad Men, the television show yeah. Mad Men? Yeah. You, my job was kind of like Don Draper. Like I wasn't an alcoholic or cheating on my wife <laughs> and I looked nothing like John Hamm. But other than that, I was exactly like Don Draper. Also, it is very unnerving to me how similar our paths were. Like, right. like I have a degree in graphic design. That was oh, my wow. Program. I did not know that. Uh, my first book that I ever wrote never got published, but it like uh -huh. paved the way for creating the rituals that would allow me to write my second book, which was The Near Witch. Like, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. I would say I didn't succeed at doing anything else before finding writing. That's really the disparate part. But yeah, like graphic design, visual minded. I'm shocked. I met a, a, a successful author the other day who does not see the no, landscape uh, in their head. Like when yeah, writing, same oh, I, I was talking with David Levithan about this. Like David Levithan right. does not see any part of the story as he's writing it. Like he yeah, does one of my besties is um cs Picat. we write yeah. or we used to write together every week before um covid yeah. happened and she's exactly the same she doesn't see at all in her head i can't imagine how that even understand. works stand like yeah I, it's very strange I see the color palette i see the sound i hear the soundtrack yeah. like i i i don't know about i choreograph as if i'm writing a movie like i want you right. to, be able I, to see I, a I, movie in your head I see the film in my head and I write down what I'm seeing. Like, it's like I can watch the action yeah. playing out in front of my mind's eye and I just transcribe what I'm seeing. So I, I found that so strange, that Twitter test to find out that some parts of the world well, don't, I get, their brains just don't work that way. I get that some people's brains don't work that way, but for a writer's brain to not work that way, like for somebody who builds stories to not actually see 
the stories. I think David had said that he just basically like heard the, the he wrote the dialogue or it kind of, he didn't, he recognized it happened. I'm stealing David's story now, but like he was on set for one of the, for their Netflix show with Rachel yep. Cohn. And Rachel Cohn was much more precious about how things looked. And it was because Rachel Cohn saw their co-written books in her head and he never sees it. So for him, he was like, yeah, sure, that looks fine. And yeah. I just was like, what does this mean? Like, how are there people? Also, apparently, though, David told me that when he co-authors, they don't actually coordinate between chapters. They, their co-author sends off the book and they don't know what they're going to get back. They have no plan. So, it, like, if you kill off this secondary character that I was planning on doing something with three chapters from now, sorry, like, that, that plan's out the window. So, so his this, style is very different. How you co-write? This is a thing. Yeah. This, is a, this is what we like to call a, a smooth transition, Jay. Uh-huh. Uh, you co-write. Um, what is, do you and, and Amy have, like, a – has it always been the same process? Or, like, do you, do you yeah, know pretty much. you plan together? Tell me about it. Yeah, we do. Um, we've gotten better at it, but yeah, it's pretty much been the same process the whole time. We we figured out through trial and error that we can only plot about 100 pages in advance because mm -hmm. story changes in the course of telling it. You'll think of a cooler idea and that, you know, if you plotted a 500-page novel and you think of a cooler idea on page 60, everything that you've done in terms of planning after that gets thrown away. So we plot about 100 pages in advance. We'll ideally go somewhere to be in the same physical location um, bounce ideas of each other all day, plot away about 100 pages and then break those 100 pages down into POVs, usually character-based, yeah. and then we will go away and write those individual chapters based on the POV that we're in charge of. We're usually like custodian, I guess, of yeah. two or three characters um, in the current work that we're doing. And, yeah, based on which POV is the best to tell that part of the story, we will go on rate and write those individual pages. I'm just trying to picture if we wrote a book together and I took David's philosophy of literally just sending you Make it up as you go. No, we would like kill everyone off by chapter three. Like I would even <laughs> no book it as a one-upmanship game of like, who's going to be left alive in this book if I kill someone in chapter one and then there's like a retaliatory murder by chapter three. Right. Like, and chapter three, it's just the end. <laughs> it's just the end. It's the shortest Yeah, story villain ever. standing atop a pile of charred hero corpses. Yeah. But I like it because <laughs> collaboration, I, I'm, I feel like I'm doing TV writing now, which is highly collaborative in that way. And it really does right. expose you to the joy of getting to pass a living document back and forth between parties. So I do, but I think it's interesting. Do you guys know your ending? Uh, generally speaking, we have a rough idea. Yeah. Okay. I find it very difficult to write without the ending in place. I need to. I, I'm, a, I'm a pantser in the sense that I don't know how I'm going to get where I'm going, but I still have a rough idea of where I'm going. I describe it as getting in a car and driving towards a city on the horizon, and I can see the city, and I might turn left or right or go through a roundabout or whatever, but as long as I keep that location in my, yeah. my view as I'm driving towards it, eventually I will get to where I need to be. Yeah. I, don't, I, I think it would be impossible to just write without knowing. And yet, and yet they exist. I mean, this is half the reason that I created this series, like this interview series, is I don't understand how my friends' brains work when they don't yeah. have a plan. <laughs> like, I, yeah, that would be I have to have an ending in mind that I'm writing towards always, you know? Yeah. And, so, and sometimes the ending ends up to be different to what I imagined it to be. Um, when I was writing Nevernight, I was having a hell of a time with the last act because I had an ending in mind that I had been driving towards for the entire novel and I realised that the novel wanted to go in a different direction. And as soon as I realised that and stopped rebelling against the momentum of the story, yeah. I finished the book in like two weeks, but I had been bashing my head against it for like six weeks before that. So sometimes you need to let that idea go in the end um yeah. and and be okay with it but yeah in order to to get any kind of forward momentum i need to know where i'm driving yeah that's fascinating to me now do you like what's your favorite part of the process not not about co-writing but like when you're writing for yourself like as yeah. your solo driver what part do you enjoy and look forward to most and what part do you dread I probably like the final polish the best. Like when everything is, when everything is screwed away and you are putting like the layer of icing on the cake, I guess. You don't have any more problems to solve. You are just making 
the the prose as as sweet as it can be and making sure that everything in there is doing a job um i'm in the process of finishing off the first draft of empire of the vampire at the moment mm-hmm. uh and i and i hate it <laughs> <laughs> but i te- but i tend to hate the thing that i'm doing at the time like yeah. i hate copy editing when i'm copy editing whenever i'm not it's like oh it's not so bad it's just punctuation but i get there and i just lose my tiny mind so sometimes it's a matter of grass it's is greener i guess yeah Always. but if i'm honest like the 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 moment where i actually get to sit and and really put that final layer on is what i find yeah most fulfilling i guess you know you can allow yourself a little moment of pride and say hey this is the thing that i did like i look at this this object that i spent the last year or two years of my life making and you actually have something to show for all that time and effort so if i'm honest that's probably the coolest part but i, I, I mean, never I'm know how i'm grateful for all of it like i never think i'm gonna get there when i'm in the rough parts oh yeah it's the same it's the same like i'm going through it right now and there's a part of your logical mind that tells you every book you've ever written, you have been in this situation before mm-hmm. and every book you've ever written, you finished and you can walk past, like, you know, I've got all my books up on a shelf. You can walk past and see that, yeah. yes, you do get through this moment. Like it is not that your, your brain is telling you a lie and there is physical proof of the lie right in front yes. of your eyes, but it still doesn't matter. <laughs> in the moment, in the moment, it's useless. Like I, yeah. I can go through it over and over again. And every time I think, I don't know how I wrote that other thing. I don't recognize that part anymore. Like it, cause you, cause the thing is I'm the same way of, I love that final polish because it's the first right. only time I'll ever read it as the reader, not as a writer. There's like a yeah. connect that happens there. Every moment up till there, I'm just like, fuck all of this. This is, yeah. this is never like, I'm, I ha- I'm driven by such fear of, and I've said this before on here, her last book was better. Like that's the fear right. that drives everything in me yeah you've already done your best yeah terrifying so wait so what's your kryptonite what's the thing that you dread the most um uh, it's it's probably what we're talking about right now it's the it's the idea that this is the time where it's not going to work like every book up till here has been a fluke and this is the wall that you're not going to be able to climb over yeah um and that's it's it's kind of a mental game that you have to play with yourself um, and trust in the process and trust in the idea that every book up to this point, it has worked out okay. You've been in this situation, every book up to this point, and it worked out okay. And, you know, the only way out is through it. It's kind of a cliche, but, but it's you have true. to just push. Yeah. Do you feel, I, I, and I don't want to like put an experience in your mouth, so tell me if this is completely erroneous, but I feel... Sure. There has to be not only the usual imposter syndrome, but coming off something like Nevernight, like the series, um, yep. coming off something that's that successful and that well received. Anytime you step from that ground onto the next place, like I really experienced that after Conjuring of Light, where I had this massive imposter syndrome coming back to Vengeful, where I thought, this isn't like, I don't know how to step from this point without stepping down. It's scary. It's frightening. Do you feel like some of the pressure that you're experiencing with Empire of the Vampire comes from coming off of such a successful trilogy? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the thing is, writing is a kind of alchemy. No one knows for sure why one book is successful and one is not. I mean, there's principles involved, obviously, but there's no logical reason why book X sells a million copies and book Y sells a thousand, um, you know, above and beyond issues of craft. But like, I, I don't know why. So, for example, in terms of sales, Illuminae is a more successful series than Nevernight. But in really? terms of fan art, yeah. Yeah, that's but what that's I mean. Like, like, but inter- like, there's the internet reception and the fandom and like fandom to book sales. Like there's so many factors here. I don't think people that, who are watching yeah. us always pick up on that that like the dark horses of our readership behave differently in like world like like vicious is my most popular book in several countries but not in america right like it's right. stressful but like darker shade of magic sweeps everything away in terms of sheer volume of book sales but i would have never guessed that yeah sure I, and that's probably true of me as well like uh, uh, um, Nevernight is probably more popular in a place like Italy, for example, than Illumina. But yeah, there, there's this intensity in the Nevernight fandom that I don't, 
I, I appreciate it, but I don't quite understand how I pulled that off. I don't yeah. know what I did exactly. Well, I don't know I can why. Tell you, it's fucking delightful, and it's like oh, it cool. was written Thanks. for me, and it was clearly written for everyone else here too. It, I found it. I mean, it's like an absolute joyride of a read. Oh, thanks. But like, you know, like aesthetically, for example, like I got a, the, the walls of my study in here are like covered in Nevernight fan art. Um, I don't know what it is about me as aesthetic that makes people want to draw her, for example. Like it's but obviously I've tapped, I've tapped into something. It's not me as aesthetic. It's your writing. And I, cause I'll tell you, cause I've read multiple of your books and of your co-written books and then Nevernight. There is something, you know, we talk about seeing what you're writing. There is something extraordinarily special in the Nevernight books in terms of the aesthetic palette in which you have written them. There is something like a clarity of purpose to that writing. It's gorgeous writing, but also it's something that I see in Shades of Magic as well. Sometimes you write something in such a way that people's vision of it is so clear. And I right. feel like there's something about Mia and that world that you have managed to pull off, which I envy because it's, it's not an easy thing to pull off, wherein it's so, it's an ambitious world that shouldn't, it's very difficult to make it as clearly codified as it is. And yet it's one, something you can see picture clear as you're reading it. The prose is wonderful. And it's not just good prose, but it's good prose that is honed to a very fine aesthetic edge. And that's why you end up with the fan art that you do is, there is something very special about the, not just the story, but about the execution of Mia and of that series that I have to commend you for, because I just think well, it's thanks. an extraordinary feat. Thank you. That's really cool of you to say. It means a lot. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't, know, I don't know how I did it. <laughs> yeah, but I talk about this, so I've talked about this in a lot of, like, in my, all my previous interviews, and this will come back to a question I'll ask you at the very end, but yeah, I was talking with an actor at a convention, and basically he was being he's being touted for his current work and people are coming up to him for work he did as a teenager. And he was talking oh, this about, you never guy, get right? to, yeah, yeah, about, yeah, he's holding. Steven. yeah. And like, you just never get to decide. And like, if you had asked me which one of my two books based on concept alone, Vicious or A Darker Shade of Magic would be the more successful, I would have absolutely said Vicious. Like, right. it wouldn't, it's like very Marvel, like it's very- Sure, conceptually wise, genre, yeah, it's super high concept. It like sells very well, but on like this quiet little, you know, it's sold the same number of copies for five, 10 years or seven years, however long it's been. And yet Darker Shade of Magic just, so it makes me think sometimes there's an, there's an immeasurable factor there as well. If there's when we yeah. find the book, there's the, what else is out there in the landscape at the time when we find the book? What do we, what are we missing? You know, for me, yeah. I found Nevernight and I was just delighted one by the narrative construct of it was delightful, but I was just like, yes, murder hero. Like I just really wanted a murder hero and like, I got it. And I love like dark academy, like dark academia. And then you pair that with like murder mercenary and like a touch of the macabre and like the violence. And it was done in such a way that I was like, oh, this is my heart book. And I feel like a lot right. of people are discovering Mia and simply feeling that like, oh, this is my heart book, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that is an intimidating <laughs> thing to follow up from. Yeah. And I, and I get why, you know, I, I get why people go back to the well, um, because leaving something like that behind it's is hard. frightening. Um, mm -hmm. and like Nevernight was a weird book in terms of trajectory. Most, most books will, sell big you know the first month or so and then sales will kind of taper off mm -hmm. um whereas never night because it, it kind of grew through word of mouth and the fandom it was it was never more popular than when dark dawn came out so yeah. the whole series went out on a high um, but that's the way do... you want i mean this is what oh, ideally yeah yeah you don't understand is the natural so the natural trajectory i'm not speaking to you you already know this but to everyone watching yeah, the sure. natural trajectory of a fantasy series or any series for that matter is that the first book does great and then you're working against a downward gravitational curve from there because the first book will always sell more copies necessarily yeah. mathematically than the subsequent books so it's a rare feat and it's a very difficult feat for the popularity of a series to increase to as the, time, yeah. the series goes on and i feel yep. like that's what happens with nevernight that's what happened with shades and like it's an incredible gift that readers have given us because normally you're going against the gravitational force of a series, which is down. 
Yeah. And so to, to leave the series behind kind of at its peak, um, that, yeah, that was, that was scary. But yeah. at the same time, I, I felt like I had told the story and, uh, I, I didn't want to be one of those. We've all, we've all got like a favorite TV show or something that just outstayed its welcome. Like you loved it for a time and then people obviously didn't want to leave it alone. And so it, it degrades with use. Um, I felt like, like I told the story, so I had to bail. When you were looking for, like, when you were considering what was going to be next, did any of it play a role? Like, when you were thinking about what am I going to, what's going to be the next solo book of mine? Because yeah. obviously, like, I feel like going from there to Empire of the Vampire is a really interesting transition because you're playing on a lot of the macabre themes and a lot of the almost aesthetic uh, notes that you hit that, that inspired so much fan art. And you're carrying yeah. that element seamlessly through while exploring a different story that has a very clever aesthetic overlap. So did, is, is that thought through or is this just, it's just you? Uh, I think it's mostly just me. Like I, I, t I tend to trend, trend dark aesthetically anyway. Um, and when I was planning, like I've been planning Empire for probably four years now. So Never Night hadn't really become what it became at the time I was pitching the idea. But yeah, I, I think it's a more logical continuation of where where i think the way my mind works and the kind of stories that i want to tell i tend to trend dark anyway but in hindsight it, it was it was probably the smart thing to do because there is that overlap like you say hopefully you're going to drag people who are into the aesthetic of one into the other yeah um but yeah it, it, it wasn't something that i did consciously i think it's just i'm a, I'm a person who trends dark by nature yeah well you may nice not know what to look at to, me it's nice when you get to lean into those things because i feel like you know, having Illuminate become so large, does it? it's great, but it doesn't always do a service to your own personal brand when you think like I am X and Y becomes very large. And Illuminate is great, but I don't necessarily think of it as super macabre or dark or like it's it's edgy, sure. but it doesn't have your same color palette, if you will. Um, yeah. And yeah. so it's, it's exciting for me to get to watch your solo work really get to embrace that palette and that aesthetic and that style the inner golf, but, yeah <laughs> yeah exactly exactly you gotta lean into it um yeah. so it, it excites me so i talk a lot about the six burner stove concept i feel like we've discussed this privately this idea of like having these yeah. things on the fire are you somebody who i mean imagine because you have co-working work and solo work that you do this but do you, are you continually germinating new concepts yeah, I, I probably don't have as many burners as six. Um, <laughs> pro realistically, probably four, and yeah. number four is on super low heat. But yeah, I had, I had a experience. Uh, I was in year ten. I'm not sure what you call it in America. Uh, junior. Like, uh, junior. Sophomore. Junior. Sorry, sophomore. sophomore year. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was terrible at math, as demonstrated by the daylight savings debacle this morning. As, as demonstrated today, that's fine. Right. Um, <laughs> and I had a teacher. A, exams used to really stress me out because i was bad at them i had a teacher that told me that if you reach a question in an exam you don't know the answer to don't just sit there and stare at the question move on to the next one and your yeah. subconscious brain will continue problem solving even though you're not consciously addressing the issue uh i'm you know that's basically the philosophy for my writing now mm -hmm. uh if i have a, a chapter or a plot point or something that's driving me mad if I have another project that I can switch gears to just to free up the conscious brain for a week or two, I find that really personally super helpful. Um, I'm a big believer in the power of the subconscious mind to problem solve even when you're uh, sometimes better than when you're looking at it consciously. Oh, and you just have that, that kind of that spark of inspiration at two o'clock in the morning or whatever. That's your subconscious that's been chugging away on a problem, even though you weren't consciously addressing it. So, yeah. I find having multiple projects on the go at any one time is really helpful in that respect. Yeah, but also, the back you know, burner. the back burner is a beautiful thing that we don't always take advantage of. Yeah, for sure. Um, but also, it's nice to be able to change up tonally sometimes as well. You know, the, the stuff that I mean, I write in the YA sphere is different tonally to the stuff that I do in my solo work. So yeah. sometimes it's good to be working a different muscle group. Uh, sometimes it's good to step away from unending bleakness in winter as is the color palette in uh, empire to something a little more light and fun so yeah, yeah it, it's a it's a matter of giving your brain a break i guess like working a different muscle group at the gym yeah it's like i was doing an interview earlier today and somebody asked me like what is your break 
from writing books. And I was like, oh, I write TV, like I'm working on TV work. And they were like, okay, yeah, right. a is a break from writing really writing? And I was like, but for me, doing TV writing, it's like a beautiful creative lens switch where suddenly the words are less precious when it comes to like description yeah. and wording and the dialogue is more precious and the framing of the scene is different. And it just, I was like, it's like playing again, you know? And I think yeah. we underestimate the, the need for play. And I know that's something that like is a very niche problem to like once you become a published author, but a lot of the play gets superseded. Sometimes it feels like by the obligation. Yeah, and sure. And I, I guess also in terms of screenwriting, do you find, because there's, there are different restrictions, I guess. Yeah. Like when you're writing for screen, you have to take into consideration stuff like budget, which yeah. you don't need to consider <laughs> at all when you're so writing fiction. That, yeah. yeah, but I mean, there's also economies in terms of the amount of words you're allowed to use. Yeah. And, you know, the scene is going to be one minute and 30 seconds long. So you have 75, 80 words that you can it's use, go. Yeah, I was so, trained on it from coming from comics. I was glad that I had the seven yeah. of comics because you go from writing a chapter and that chapter is as long as the chapter needs to be to being like, you have 22 pages. And you yeah, can't yeah. like, you have 22 pages times four for the comic that I was writing and like, you can't go longer. And I was like, can yep. I just have like an extra signature? Like, could I have an extra spread there? And they're like, no. And so- No, no, was, that costs us. But it's totally different. Like I had to cut down a script that I was working on from like, 58 pages to 55 and I was like this is hard it's really <laughs> but, hard yeah yeah it it's like it's hard. like writing short fiction you know a short story it's 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 a similar principle but the actual rules by which you engage with the yeah. story are, are totally different and those and yet, different challenges can yet, be if I'm expected to write a novel it can feel like a break to switch gears, it can feel like right. a to switch from one format to another. So I think it's 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 operating on those different levels and maybe backburnering one thing so that you can prioritize for that day and stretch a different muscle. Yeah, and I mean the, the good thing about that is you're you're still writing, but you are yeah, like you say, making it fun again. Sometimes when you're doing it for a living, even though it is you know by far and away the greatest job I have ever had, uh, and you know, the greatest job in the world that I can imagine. It can sometimes feel like work. So yeah. it's good to be able to inject that, that sense of fun back into it again, however you manage to. Now, is there a form that you haven't written in yet that you would like to be a comic script um, play? Like, is there anything, cause you seem to play in a lot of different, you know, playgrounds. Yeah. Um, yeah, there is, but uh, I would, I would like to write long form television. I mean, I've, I've written short form TV before, um, but I think there's a, there's a certain arrogance in thinking that you can do it, you know, just because you can play the guitar doesn't mean you can play the violin. The yeah. principles are the same, but they're different instruments. So um, I, I would like to write long form TV. I'd probably like to have a shot of comics as well, but I wouldn't want to go into it flippantly. I'd, uh, it wouldn't be something that I decided on a whim. It'd have, be something that I studied for properly. I, would, yeah. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to assume that I can do one just because I could do the other. Like I'm, I'm good friends with a guy named Tom Taylor, who is a super famous comic writer here in Australia, and I watch the way he works. And I've started reading comics again for the first time in probably twenty years. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of studying the craft of that form now, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the moment, I'm I'm still kind of full time on all the novels. So even thinking about another project at this point, I can I can feel my agent <laughs> glowering over my shoulder. No, <laughs> my I, editor I is glowering over this shoulder. Uh, so until I get my shit sorted, I I'm, I'm not allowed to even think about anything else. But I think it's really I think that's a really really wise way to think of it because the first time I went into comics, I went in at the request of one of my publishers who does comics, mm -hmm. and it was trial by fire right so like, i didn't know thankfully like i didn't go in thinking i'm gonna rock at this i went in thinking like i am fucked like i don't know how to write comics and i didn't yeah. and i learned but i think the key to writing in a new form is one the humility of not assuming that you know how to write in that form and two being surrounded by people either mentors or colleagues or hand holders or shepherds who can educate you and walk you through the process like yeah. it's, it is I will say like 
the more forms I write in, the more, the more, I feel like I'm accruing powers, right? I'm like, now this one's mine and this one's mine. And this. But yeah, like, sure. they are, I mean, the first time I ever wrote a TV pilot, I was lucky enough to have a producer who was shepherding me through and it was still nine grueling months on a Shades of Magic TV pilot that after those nine months and maybe like 15 rounds of revision and me learning a shit ton, that we then decided to sell it for film instead. So it was like, and I kind of look at this, and, I, and you know, for a moment I was like, oh, what a waste of nine months. And I was like, no, I've accrued no. a power. And then I sold something else. And then I'm learning to write a TV show now. Um, and like, I don't, I don't say any more about it because I don't know if it'll happen. But like, then all of a sudden, instead of starting here, I was starting here. And everyone else was yeah. still up here. But it's like, it's about having the patience with your own craft. And it's hard because like, we now have a lot of experience as novelists and like we have put in our dues to become novelists. And then like we, if you enter a new field, you don't get to come in up here as a novelist. You come in down here as a novice. Sure. And that's- But hard. also I think the, the idea of any work being wasted is a bit of a fallacy. Even, you know, I am, a pantser in the sense that I might have a destination in mind, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. Sometimes I waste an enormous amount of waste. On, waste is the wrong word. That's my point. Sometimes I write a lot of words that don't get used. I'll be exploring a plot that ends up going nowhere, or I'll realize that I've taken a wrong turn. And I, I you know, on some books I've thrown out 80,000 words. Like the, the, the first, <laughs> book, for real, the first Nevernight book, I probably threw about a about hundred thousand words from Nevernight. I spent this huge chunk of time exploring Mia's childhood and it got used in the sense that it informed me of who she was as a character. Um, and that was, you know, that's my point. It, even though the words didn't get used, the labor wasn't wasted because it informed the words that ultimately did get used on the page. So I think, so I think if you're, if you're flexing, if you're working, even if those words aren't used, you're still learning in some capacity. But this is the thing. I think I have, I don't know, this is where it becomes therapy session, right? I think it's like right. my ego struggles with it a little bit because, you know, now I'm working on something. I'm working on a show and I don't know if the show will happen and I don't know if I'll even get to announce it. And I've spent months now working on it. And if I spent that much time working on a novel, I would be able to announce it and it would right. be themselves. And even if for some reason my publishers didn't want it, I could still just put it out there, right? It's so weird to then enter an industry where the erasure of the end product is a risk that you just simply take by playing the game. And well, I mean, it's a norm. When you're working huge. in television and film, most things don't ever get up. They never see yeah. the light of day. It's just the, the, just the cost just of doing business. Of and yeah. I'm like, my heart, my, my book writing heart is like, Huh. Like, <laughs> like it's good there's probably like the vast majority like the greatest chance is that nobody will ever see it you know oh yeah like, i mean it's, it's the same as writing ads i mean that that was my life like you would yeah. write a hundred ideas you would present two of them and both of them would probably get killed in market research like that was just the norm uh, but like i say it's even yeah, it, it, it's it's helping you learn. If nothing else, you're educating yourself. You're getting you're you're getting better at what you do. If there's an end product to show for your labor, then wonderful. But yeah. as long as that that work is ultimately informing the work that does get seen by the world, then it's not wasted effort. This thing, it's all craft work, right? It's all like you 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 pay your dues in each craft on one side or the other. Some people pay it in drafting. Some people pay it in revision. Some people pay it in all the work that goes buried for the pieces that don't, you know? Right. So do you have any, you've got that first book you wrote, which was your education novel, right? The thing that taught you yeah. to write a book. Do you, did you, have you ever ended up with anything else trunked or have you finished everything you started? Um, I have, I have a couple of half finished projects. Yeah. I wouldn't say they were trunked, but you know, they've just been, they've been put on the back back burner because of the necessity of doing work that I've already sold in. So I, I have some ideas that are probably not explored as much as I would like to, yeah. but you know, it, it's a matter, it's a matter of time. Um, but yeah, the only, the only novel that I've written that is so bad, it's unusable uh, is that, that first one in theory anyway. Um, but it had a point, right? Like it had a point that taught you. Right. And yeah, even there is one idea in that book that I'm using in Empire, for example. Um, it's it's a world building idea that I poach. So yeah, like I said, the, the labor isn't wasted. Um, you know, that that novel is the novel that taught me the discipline of sitting down and writing every day. 
Yeah. Um, and that's a principle that I've brought into my career and, and still use to this day. So even if that 120,000 words was, will never see the light, the lessons that I learned in writing those words inform my career now. So yeah, and, it's, and it's not wasted. I think that's such an important point. There's no expiry date on ideas, you know, like my, I have one truck novel, which is that first book, which taught me how to write a book, but it also wasn't good. But there was one element in that book that I would then take and it would become City of Ghosts 16 books later. So like you right. just never know where you're going to learn something or hold on to a seed of something, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, the, the, the seed in the world building of that first book is the seed of the world building in Empire. So yeah, yeah it, it lives on in some form, I guess. It's it comes back around, right? Now yep, you talked about writing, writing discipline and I feel like you're far more disciplined than I am. So can you, really? like, do you write every day? And if so, do you write a specific number of words? Yeah, I do. Uh, I write, Monster. I probably write at the moment I'm writing six days a week. Uh, and when I'm in full draft mode, I aim for 3000 words a day. Um, I don't always get that. Um, I usually do. Uh, I found uh, through trial and error that that is the comfort point. Like I would use, I used to push through and do 5,000 words, but I would pay for that later in the week. I would have a 2000 word day and a 1000 word day. So 3000 is about where I sit comfortably. If I know what I'm doing and where I'm going, I will be able to knock out that every day. Um, and that, I think it partly came from when I was first writing, I was writing in snatches of time. Like when I was still working a day job, I would write on my lunch break and I would write when I got home from work, you know, I would, I'd go to work, work through to one o'clock. I'd book a meeting room, go into that meeting room with my laptop and smash a thousand words at the yeah. end of my lunch break. I would go back to work. I would come home, spend a couple of hours staying married. And then I would stay up until two o'clock in the morning every night. And I kind of, I did that for five years, um, yeah. you know, working till two o'clock in the morning every night for five years. So I, I kind of got into, the work mindset mm -hmm. and I treat it as a job. You know? yeah. um, if I, if I was working a regular office job and I didn't feel like going into work that day, tough shit. Like <laughs> it's your job. Go fucking do yeah. it. Like if you don't want to do it, you get fired. Um, so that's, that's the type of mentality I try and bring to it. Um, I want to hate yeah. you. I want to hate <laughs> you for it. Like I do, I want to, but at the same time, like I just have so much respect for it that I can't. Hate it. Do you, you're, you're not an everyday person? No, I am. You're an right when the person. news takes you. No, no, no. Well, fuck that. No. No. You know, I write every day, but I, um, depending on where I'm at in the project, I have to measure time instead of word count. Because if I, right. there are just some days where I'll, I'll spend five, six hours straight working and I might have like a thousand words to show for it because I was thinking or I struggled or I wrote 3,000 and deleted 2,000 because I edited as yep. a go. And so, yeah, so I do used I. to like beat myself up about how many words I ended up with positive at the end of the day, yes. not how much work went into those words. And so yes. for mental health reasons, about a year or two years ago, I switched. And I also find to be very frank, like it depends on what I'm writing. Cause like 1500 words of middle grade feels as strenuous as 3000 words of an adult novel. And like, it depends. Yeah. A short story, which is like 6,000 words, could take me a whole week because it's a short story. I mean, so I, I was so getting work, yeah. really pissed off at myself if I wasn't hitting like 2,000 words every day. And so I... I know, I I know exactly what you're talking about right now. Um, like I, I'm, I'm in that mindset right now on Empire um, yeah. because I'm in a particularly hard part of the book. My, write, my word rate to, will just slow down. I'm doing like 2,000 words. And unless I stop myself, I beat myself up about that. Yeah. It's like, because I'm used to be doing, I'm used to doing three and now I'm only doing two. So something is going wrong. And that feeling of going wrong starts to encroach on every other part of the process. So yeah, you need, you need to be, I guess, forgiving of yourself if you don't hit those targets. Yeah. But at the same time, I found unless I set myself that target, I'll just, I just kind of wander around yeah. um, because I'm like, I, I'm like you, I, I, edit as I go like I begin every writing session by reading and editing the stuff that I wrote the day before and if I let myself I can just fiddle with those previous days words for hours and hours on end like agonizing about a sentence or a paragraph or a structure or whatever so unless I set myself a target like dude you need to get to 3,000 words today 
I will, I will just play in the sandpit of words. Um, so yeah, I, I, I kind of have to walk that line between setting targets to keep myself moving forward, but at the same time being a little bit forgiving if I don't hit those targets sometimes because of reasons, whatever those reasons it's might be. Such a hard balance. I mean, and I think, you know, as you have multiple books that are in the pipeline at the same time, and then suddenly you're juggling revisions and drafting and promotion and all of these other things, which I think we don't always take into account when we think, well, what is, you know, a thousand words a day, 2000 words a day. And I'm like, yes, but when you're doing it on top of, I needed to film five videos for international countries today. And I needed to yeah. also revise this cover copy and all of these things. Like, how would you, you, I know some of my friends are very rigid in that, like, this is my writing time and nothing else but writing happens in that time. Is that how you are? Yeah, I, I have writing days and I have admin days. Like, uh, it's it's hard sometimes. So we're in the promo cycle for Aurora Burning at the yeah. moment. That is probably eating, you know, two hours a day um, at the moment. And that's just the necessity of it. But that only happens for a, a relatively intense and short period of time. And then the book is out and, it, and it will, you know, you'll be able to get back to a more regular schedule. So usually I will set aside an entire day just for admin. So I'm quite bad on email unless something is literally on fire, then the email get answered at the end of the week. Yeah. And yeah, I try and I try and block out chunks of time in which, you know, the entire world is on a hold while I write. Um, right. And I, and I, you know, get super intense and super grumpy if something interrupts that. Um, because yeah, like you, like you say, you have all these tiny jobs that are taking chunks out of your day. And unless you put something in the way, those tiny jobs will end up eating the entire day. And it's I not like you can- I still struggle with it. I still struggle. Right, you, you know, it, it takes time to get back into the mindset of the novel. It takes time to, to get yourself in a position where you can write. It's not like, like I, I think back three or four years ago where I could walk in, like I say, to those meeting rooms on my lunch break and sit down and just smash a thousand words and then go back to work. I don't know how the fuck I did that. No. Like I, I, I can't do that anymore. I have to actually sit with the book and think about it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, those it's, it's not even necessarily admin tasks, but minutia can end up chewing up huge chunks of your day unless you put partitions in place. Yeah. So for me, I just block everything out and I, and I do my admin on a Sunday and unless something is actually on fire, it gets ignored <laughs> until the end of the week. It's smart because it's it's hard because it feels like everything's on fire all the time, <clears throat> and then yeah, and then it, but the problem is from a mental health perspective, from a creative health perspective, if you don't put those walls up, then the work won't get done, and then your mental health just spirals out into like self-flagellation because you didn't get the work done. You know, like my yeah. mental health is so much better if I just turn it off and get my writing done and then turn it back on. Yeah, but it's still so hard, especially these days. And it's one of the weird things you can never really complain about because it's a product of success, which is that your sure. time becomes more in demand to do things which are not writing your books. Yeah, and definitely. you're like, you can't complain about it. But at the same no, time, you have to be grateful for that. It's one of the best have problems to, to have. Of course, but like but it, I look back at who I was in school when I was writing my first novel, or even when I went to graduate school and wrote three books that year. And I'm like, I don't know. Who yeah. that was. Like, I don't know yeah. how it existed. Well, look, I'm I've taken a lot of your morning and I'm, I'm, I feel like everyone just wants to, um, to hear you talk, but I, it's I, have two, I have two last questions. Sure. Um, wh how do you feel the role of romance plays in your books? In terms of the importance of it? Yeah. Like when you're writing, do you prioritize it in your planning? Is it an after effect? Is it a reward or is it kind of a crucial point? Uh, it's, it's not crucial. It's definitely secondary. Um, but it, it, I guess it's essential secondary. Uh, it's, it's never the primary focus of the novel, but it is probably an essential part of the stories that I tell. I don't think to this date that I've written a book that doesn't have a romance element. Um, but as far as it being the point of the work or the motivation for the story, I haven't written that kind of story yet. That's, that's not, the way my brain works. I don't know whether that's just the way I'm built mentally or, or a product of the kind of stories that I'm telling or the genre that I'm working in. I tend to stray towards sci-fi fantasy and it's quite rare that romance is a principal element in that kind of storytelling. It's, it's not totally unheard of, but yeah, it, it's, 
it's probably secondary but still essential. Like the romantic relationships in Nevernight were, yeah, they, they were secondary drivers and character motivators for me. Yeah. In Empire, the romance is, it's a critical element of the story. It certainly, uh, it certainly leads the story in terms of direction, but it's not the primary focus thereof. Yeah. So yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, it, it certainly underpins everything. It certainly, it certainly tends to drive momentum in the story, but it's never really in the spotlight in that sense. It's kind of weird. That's a good question. Yeah, it's, I've never one of my, about that before. it's one of my favorite things about your books is I feel like it's, it's a key part of character development, but you don't under, you don't downplay the other kinds of relationships in the interest of romance. Like there are other natures of relationships, be they ally or adversaries or whatever those are. And they don't yeah. downplay it in the interest of a romantic threat. Yeah. Like the, it's interesting that there's, there are two timelines in empire, for example, and I guess looking at it critically, the principal motivator in the first one is romance. It's a romantic relationship, yeah. but the principal, the principal engine of the second and probably the main timeline, it's like a platonic father daughter style mm -hmm. relationship. There is, there is literally no romance in that second timeline, but it's an essential part of the first one and it informs the motivations in the second one. So I guess, yeah, it's, it's actually a really interesting <laughs> question thinking about it critically. It, yeah. It's an essential, but never primary part of the stories that are right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can't wait for Empire for that reason. And that kind of leads me to my, my last question, which is a question that I have to ask everybody because I'm too curious. Um, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but if, you know, we don't get to pick which books of ours are most successful or how they're received, we really don't get to pick any part of the reception. Um, yeah. If you could pick which of your books got to outlive you, but it could only be one book, what would it be? Out of the books that I've written, or it have to be no. I mean, I would, I'd have to take the optimistic point of view and say that it's the book that I haven't written yet. I guess, <laughs> um, and that's that. That sounds like maybe a cop out, but no, one of, I guess, I am. I I'm a very ambitious person by nature. Um, I I tend to look with enthusiasm towards the things that are coming and the things that I've done, you know, they're locked in stasis. I can't change them. I don't have any control yeah. over them. They are what they are. Um, the thing that I'm building now is the thing that I have to be most excited about. Um, so, you know, in the immediate it's empire, but in 10 years from now, it might be a totally different book. I'm, I think, I think the society that we live in at the moment, we are in serious danger of, being sick with nostalgia like we're in a world now where reboots and remakes and recycles yeah. are everything you know where massive ips are just having work after work after work churned out you know, star wars star trek whatever and there are millions of stories hundreds of thousands of amazing books that will never see the light of day they never get made because we're in love with this thing that we wrote and lived 40 years ago you know trying to recapture that feeling you had when you were five and walked in and saw star wars for the first time we're like heroin junkies chasing the high <laughs> of that first hit um so yeah i i'm a firm believer in looking with more enthusiasm towards the horizon in front of you rather than the one behind you so i'll take the cop out answer and say it's the <laughs> book that i haven't written yet is it a book that, do you feel like it's one that you've even started thinking of or no? Maybe, yeah. Um, you know, I, like I said, I'd like to think it's Empire, but uh, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I like to think that one day I'll be rich and famous enough to buy the castle next to Joe Rowling's in Scotland. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, have, I obviously haven't written that book. You yet, haven't so. written that one. <laughs> no, not yet. Like, this is, this is a nice house, but it's not quite a castle. It's not in Scotland. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I, I try and maintain enthusiasm about what, whatever project that I'm working on at the time um, because this is the coolest job that I've ever had. It is... You know, I, I've worked a lot of careers over the course of my life and nothing comes close to being able to sit and tell stories for a living, to touch people's lives and to have people tell you that, you know, 
this book got me through some really rough times or, uh, you know, I had this amazing experience where a reader came up to me at the Sydney Dark Door launch and, and asked me to sign their book and looked me in the eye and said, I wouldn't be here if not for this book. Like, what job do you get to do that has that kind of impact on people's lives? So, Holy yeah. I, authors. <laughs> right, right. Um, it's amazing and it's a privilege and I feel incredibly lucky to be able to do it and incredibly grateful to the readers who let me do it. So... I have to I have to maintain that sense of enthusiasm about the thing that I'm working on now because I can't imagine doing anything else. Like, I don't know how I, I did anything before this and I have no idea what I would do afterwards. So, yeah, it, it's an amazing thing I get to do. We get well, to do. that's an amazing answer. And like, Jay, maybe one day we'll write a book together. Who knows? Maybe. Maybe. We'll uh, if we can figure out how to make our styles compatible, uh, our, our right. creative processes compatible, I'm pretty sure everyone would die, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, look, I know it's I super, the point of the book. I knew it's super early there. You're one of my favorite people. Thank you so much for chatting with me and, and doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for thinking of me. It was really cool. Um, hopefully, we'll get to have a drink in the real on the same time zone sometime <laughs> really soon. At least a little closer together where we're not like technically I guess we are in the same day now but it didn't start out that way right um, <laughs> you are an absolute joy and wonderful I cannot wait to read everything that you write I can't wait to read Eddie too um oh, congratulations wow. everyone seems super excited about it so yeah I, I'm I'll really trade you to... I'll trade you Addy for Empire one of these days <laughs> all right well i mean Ad Addie's gonna be out in the real world when like september yeah october yeah. october so super yeah. soon yeah so it will be a real thing before i have proofs of empire but uh yeah i'm looking forward to it it sounds amazing awesome. and everyone seems to well, be really enjoying it so far so well thank you Congrats, and thank dude. you everyone who tuned in and, and jay i'll see you yes thank you everybody <laughs> all right have a great day jay all right see you mate take care Bye.